So, thank you all for coming today. Um, I think everybody knows who I am, just in case you don't. My name is Leo Ornetta. I'm the director for public interest programs here at Golden Gate. And I'm very honored to um, welcome our speakers here today. We're going to be talking to you, as you know, about how to interview specifically within the context of PIPS Day. Um, they've graciously taken time out of their very busy schedules to come and share their advice with you. Um, I'm just going to ask them a series of questions, hopefully moderate a, a discussion, and then definitely open it up to you uh, to ask questions of your own. A couple of quick things to bear in mind. I have passed around a sign-in sheet, which is where? If you haven't signed in, please do so. Secondly, uh, we are videotaping. It's my hope, certainly, that the videotape will be up on, the, on our private YouTube channel in advance of PIPS Day. I can't be sure that that's going to be accomplished. At the very least, I want to record it for posterity. But uh, if you have any objection to being filmed or having your voice heard, if you're asking a question, now's the time to leave. Great. So with that said, I'll introduce our illustrious panel. To my left is Catherine Kilda. She is a staff attorney at the Center for Biological Diversity. She works in the Oceans Program to protect marine species and ecosystems. She received her law degree from the University of Virginia and a Master's of Science from the College of William and Mary, Virginia Institute of Marine Science, and her bachelor's degree in ecology and evolutionary biology from Dartmouth. Before becoming, before becoming an attorney, Catherine worked as a legislative staff for the U.S. House Resources Committee, Subcommittee on Fisheries, Wildlife, and Oceans. Prior to joining the center, Catherine practiced environmental law at Downey Brand LLP in the center. To her left is Michael Wynn. Michael serves as a senior staff attorney in one justice's San Francisco office, where he leads the organization's statewide pro bono. <coughs> Many of you who have performed pro bono uh, <coughs> Uh, projects or clinics at Golden Gate might know Michael because he's often at our Justice Bus Trips and, and clinics. Um, one Justice's uh, programs, as I said, include the Justice Bus Project and they connect urban pro bono resources to isolated and rural communities in California as well. Uh, he's also involved with the Lost and Pro Bono Project. Uh, in his work, Michael often advises legal services nonprofits, law firms, law schools, and in house counsel on how to improve current pro bono partnerships and create effective new pro bono programs. To Michael's left is Mateka Hanley. Mateka is a third year law student. She came to law school after serving a year with AmeriCorps and running volunteer programs for Bay Area nonprofits. She knew she wanted to continue working in the public interest field and specifically on uh, juvenile issues. During law school, she has had five internships. Two of those job opportunities she received through PIPS Day. All of these internships involved working with children. The Solano Public Defenders, the Solano County Public Defender's Office and the Juvenile Unit, Legal Services for Children, East Bay Children's Law Offices, Children's Law Center at Sacramento, and the Superior Court of San Francisco, with Judge Colfax. Uh, I'm going to take his left to Sherry Alcantara. She's from Sonoma County. She was born in the Philippines. Sher uh, Sherry's a second year. Um, her family immigrated to the U.S. But when she was 12 years old from the Philippines. She is deeply committed to public interest law and has an incredible amount of experience in direct legal services in particular. She obtained, I believe, her internship at Bay Legal last year through PIPS Day. So I thought I'd go ahead and start, folks, by asking um, each of you how students can best prepare for interviews at PIPS Day. Okay. So I think that um, PIPS is pretty intense in terms of interviews are short, and the person that you're interviewing with, the attorney, is going to be seeing a lot of faces. So you should think of it almost as a public speaking exercise for yourself, where you have something prepared where you can go in and explain your resume in four sentences. Like what drives you, what ties your experiences together, what you studied in school. Um, and have that be really a really short, interesting story that you're ready to give right when you sit down with the person interviewing you. Because it's hard for them to remember all the details that are on your resume. They don't want to be flipping back and like trying to remember where you went to school, where you're from, why you're here, why you're interested in the place that you are applying for. Um, so I think it's really important to have a little opening story, have a couple of points that you know you want to fit in during the interview, almost have it in your head like a road map like you're doing food court, and then have a little conclusion that you're going to leave them with, say, I'm really interested. 
interested in your organization because of this. So I think that while you can definitely wing it and you want it to seem familiar and like a conversation, you also really need to have some prepared points that you want to make sure that you get across to the people <coughs> who are doing it. I, yeah, I happen to agree, and I think my, my advice I think fits into that pretty well, um, which is that um, in, in the public interest and public service world, I think it's really important for each one of you to have a narrative to tell about your uh, your, your path um, in life and how it's led you to this one opportunity. I know it's hard. Many of you will have, will have several interviews, um, if not many, in one given day, uh, so it might be difficult to, to build a narrative that gets you exactly to each of them, um, but, but I'd ask you to strive to do that. Um, and, and, and one of the challenges is, and one of the challenges that I had was sort of fitting everything into the narrative. Um, uh, maybe you worked in the private sector, and now you want to work for a nonprofit, and you have a hard time explaining why, why you did that, and, and now you know, why, why have you shifted. Um, so I'd, I'd only say you can fit that stuff in, and don't strain it too much, um, uh, but be honest and forthright. But again, I think coming up with a story of like, why you ended up in this room, and why this job fits perfectly into, into your story uh, is really important in our world. Uh, so you're preparing for interviews. I, I believe there's a worksheet on the Legal Services website of generic questions that are most commonly asked. And I also did a Google search for interview questions, and I printed them all, and I wrote out answers to all of them. And you start to see a repeating pattern about the same kinds of questions that people are going to ask. They're going to ask you about, they could ask you about a hard time that you had, a challenging experience, or a time when you showed leadership. And you start to see the repeating questions. And um, I built an answer for all of them so that I wouldn't be surprised when the question came. Um, so that is something that I did to prepare for interviews. Um, in addition to what Dave already mentioned, I would say also really do your research on um, the organizations or the, um, whoever is going to interview you and just make sure to look at their job descriptions or what the skills that they're looking for and uh, compare it to your resume or whatever else experience you have that are not in your resume. So I would just reiterate, really do your research on that point. And that's true probably regardless of the number of interviews that, that, that can have some of you in front of you. Um, Catherine Michael, specifically, I was hoping to ask you, what do you try to learn about a candidate during an interview? What is, um, I mean, you've obviously reviewed their materials. Uh, you've made a pass, you, you, they've, made, they've stated something that has caught your eye in the cover letter and the resume. Uh, so what, what do you go into the interview uh, then trying to surmise? Yeah. Oh, sure, sure. Um, I think in particular what I look for is, especially um, in the, you know, for, for nonprofit jobs, um, is for the ability to, um, to connect um, personal work with, um, with bigger picture goals. Um, uh, and to convey that convincingly. And so I do look for, I, I will ask candidates about their prior experiences, um, and I'd love to hear them talk about what they did and what that meant. Um, and it could be, even in a private sector setting, if you have a story to tell about the work you did there, and even if it was like punching numbers into a spreadsheet, for you to talk about, well, this is what I did, and here's what it was for, and here's what it meant to the law firm, and here's what it ended it, ended, you know, with, uh, for me, really important, I find, that um, it shows that um, that that you know people you won't get bogged down by all the particulars that go along with you know a practice in law. And I think that's very true, and it's really important also in the public interest sector because we have relatively flat organizations. You have to take a lot of ownership and responsibility for your projects. So that as long as you can see the big picture, that's great. You know, if you're at a law firm and you're an associate, you might be working on one little research question and that's all you have to think about. But because there are so few of us that work on any given issue, it's really great to have a bigger picture. Um, but one of the things that we really look for because I work for an environmental organization is we look for people who are committed to the environment. And that could be, um, you know, it could be that when you were little, you spent a lot of time in the summers outdoors, and that's what motivated you. But it it can't be cheesy, but it has to be personal. Uh, and so it's a fine line between those two things. But I would say don't hold back, because that's what makes the individual candidates um, 
exemplary is that they have a real passion for the work that we do. So you can <coughs> do that by knowing what we do to begin with, but then also taking your personal experiences and relating it to what we do. And I think a lot of people were sort of nodding their heads because I have been saying a lot of the same things. <laughs> Thanks for bearing me out on that, Catherine. Um, what are, uh, and, and specifically for the two of you again, what are some of the most impressive or even least impressive responses you get to the questions that you typically ask? You have to go first now. <laughs> <laughs> Alternate <laughs> You know, the, the questions that we ask are not meant to be difficult. So when we say, what interests you about the center? That's one of our first questions every single time. Um, and so you should have some of that personal experience that I just talked about and the research. <coughs> but really, just a wider understanding of what we do. So if the people that are really impressive are people that understand from our website what the interesting legal questions are that we work on. So, you know, the big picture is that we're an environmental organization. The smaller picture is that we have a niche because we focus on endangered species. And the laws protecting endangered species are very strong. And therefore, we can have a staff made up of a lot of attorneys because we have a lot of opportunity to litigate um, and to achieve results through judicial remedy. And so when you see a whole bunch of different environmental organizations next to each other, they might all be lawyers and you can't, the outside person won't be able to distinguish them immediately, but when you're inside, it's very apparent that different organizations have different um, ways that they operate. And so the people that can pick up on that, that come into our interviews, it's really impressive if they know that we focus on endangered species and they can see how we use, even though we have Clean Air Act lawsuits, it's still species-based to protect species. Um, so the more research you can do and then the more sophistication you can give in your answers about observations of how we work in the legal world, that's what makes it interesting. Yeah, can we just get to agree with each other? <laughs> sure. I, I think that's spot on. I, I, I've seen, I think, right. The same thing to answer your question, Lear, but the, the answers that impress me show um, uh, an understanding of the work we do and how we achieve our goals. And the, the answers that are least impressive are the ones that either get it totally wrong or that don't include any information about at least what our big picture goals are. Um, the, the problem, the challenge for everybody in this room, and I, I just want to apologize on behalf of the nonprofit community, is that we are notorious for putting almost no information about the work that we do on our websites. Um, and we are, what we are notorious for is for giving you sort of like 30 line soliloquies on like how we're changing the world, you know, person by person. Um, it is, I can't, I can't even fathom how difficult it is for you. Um, and, uh, and so I think you know, I, would, I would advise everybody to try and look past that, or at least look deeper. Um, sometimes looking at attorney bios and seeing what particular work they're doing will give you a better idea about what those organizations do. Um, sometimes it means looking off that website and on other websites and how, how those organizations are mentioned um, on other websites, third party websites. Um, but yeah, again, showing, um, showing a good understanding of how those organizations work to meet their goals. Because really the websites are only going to tell you their goals. The, the websites are not meant for you, they're meant for, for funders. <laughs> it, it's it's point uh, uh, They're meant for funders. Um, and so it, the websites are always going to say that we are, you know, like the oceans will be clean when we're done, and every person in California will have legal help by the time we, we, we like just get past our one year plan. Um, so it, it just requires more digging than that. So I wouldn't depend on the, web, on the website. <laughs> Dovetailing on that briefly, I'll say that there are thousands of resources at your fingertips beyond the site's um, uh, internet site itself. You could go to if it's a it's a if it's an office uh, like Catherine's that does a good amount of litigation, maybe you can go and do a Lexis Westlaw search and find out about some of the cases that they've involved in, they've been involved in recently, and then surmise some of their special some of the issues that they're dealing with, as she said, right now. Um, so that's important from the litigation standpoint. But you should definitely. You know, run company reports. I mean, you can use the resources at your fingertips to find other ways of figuring out where these organizations are specialized. Um, thanks. 
Um, Mateka and Sherry, could you tell us, I think, uh, briefly, maybe some of the tougher questions that you had, um, either in a uh, sort of PI guest interview or otherwise for some of the students? Uh, so I would say uh, my past interview, I was asked, um, what can you tell us about yourself that is not in your resume? Which is kind of tough because you prepare there, you go to an interview and you look at your resume and you review your res resume, so you're so focused on what's in there or your cover letter that you sometimes forget what else you've done or what else you can um, offer to that position. So that was a little bit tough for me. I was taken back because I've never been asked that question. How did I answer? Um, I just uh, spoke about uh, kind of like my background, where I came from, and um, just I talked about my dogs. I don't know if that worked. Well, I, I got the I got the decision, but I talked about something that's not there just to make make the conversation going and to keep uh, just to make it myself more personable, I guess. Um, because I feel like if they're asking you for something that's not in your resume, they're asking you for more than just your appointment history. Um, I got asked um, a hypo in my interview, and it was out of my first year, and it was in children's law, which I had no experience in and hadn't studied. We had just done property contracts, etc. And I got um, an incredibly difficult hypo about uh, parents dealing drugs out of their house, and a four-year-old was there, and the four-year-old wanted to stay, and it was just a super complex hypo that I, I did not know the answer to, and so I started to struggle, and I kind of made it up, and I got stopped, and they were like, all right, good try. Um, I, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I really crashed and burned, and I, I knew that that did not go well. Um, and I did not get that internship. But I did see that person actually at a training, and she recognized me and I said, yes, you, you interviewed me and um, gave me this hypo that was incredibly difficult. This was a year and a half later, so I had a lot of children, uh, experience in children's law at that point. And I said, why did you ask me that? And she's like, well, I just wanted to see like, how you would do. Um, like the law wasn't important, I just kind of wanted to see how you were quick on your feet and how you recovered when I asked you questions and um, so if you get a hypo, uh, maybe it's not necessarily about your knowledge of the law, since especially if you're coming out of your first year, people probably don't expect you to know the ins and outs of very difficult issues like children's law, but more so just how quick you are on your feet and how you really are to recover quickly. Um, but that was, a, that was, obviously I remember it so vividly because I was horrified <laughs> and um, did, did terribly. <laughs> Fair. Um, she agreed to interview you again, though? No? Uh, she did. Uh, that's nice. Um, Michael, Catherine, would you mind sharing some of your, um, uh, some of the questions in, in your experience you found students to stumble on, if any? Oh, that's why you're possibly sitting there. That's fair enough. Um, I, um, I, I actually, and not to be repetitive, uh, but, but it's, it's fair, it bears repeating. Uh, I find that people um, stumble most when I ask them about how prior experiences might relate to, to their work at, at my organization. Um, I, I, I just think, I feel like they've, they've like, either treated their resume as like just the highlights that, that you think matter, or as just sort of like a record of everything you've done, um, but haven't necessarily thought through. And by the way, the latter is probably better, but you have to come in with a story. You have to find a way to fit all that stuff into it. And if, and if you can't, if there's something that's just so off the wall different, then you should just admit it. You should just be like, oh, that was just a summer job. I mean, I, but I think you could probably fit in everything without straining. I was a, Every summer in college, I was a I was a summer camp counselor, and I was not I am not sure how that related to any job afterwards. But I think in some instances I was like, oh, that was just to make money during the summer so I could like pay for books um, at school. Um, and I think that's a fine answer. But again, I see people struggle so often in 
not having something ready, like not something, not necessarily at the tip of your tongue, but something that you thought of at some point in your preparations. Everything on your resume, you should think like, hey, I might get a question about how this relates, and just have something. Whether it's like, that was money for books, that taught me how to like work with the, you know people and contrasting visions for a, a you know a common goal. It's come up with something and be prepared to speak about it because it just it just looks like you don't care and that's the worst thing. Uh, that's the worst way you can come across in a, in a public interest uh, interview. Absolutely, I think demonstrate commitment is key. And I think when 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 interviewees stumble on questions like that, it underscores a concern on the part of the interviewer that maybe the student isn't really excited about this work or, or isn't sure themselves whether or not this is the work that they want to do, even though that might not necessarily be true. So if you're having difficulties with that, definitely come see me. Yeah, we always ask where else you're applying because it shows us um, just what your interests are and where you might end up. And so I would recommend being prepared for that question and you looking at where you're applying and thinking how that fits into your future game plan. Um, you know, when the, the interviewer asks you about what your future plans are, have a ready answer. And I think don't say, oh, well, I'm just taking classes and I'm not really sure what kind of law I'm practice, because that's not what we're looking for. We want someone that's pretty committed and wants to work for us, basically. Um. That was probably the, the harder series of questions. I'll let up now. Uh, I, I am curious, some students come to me and they express concerns about academic performance. Uh, or, or um, and, and, and they're concerned about how to address that. Uh, I don't know if you had any thoughts you'd like to share. If the students feel like their academic performance isn't as strong. Yeah, I think it's a sliding scale for us. You know, we have people come in to have great academic records and then don't have a lot of experience um, doing environmental work or outreach work or campaign or anything public interest actually. And that presents more of a problem for us than having lower grades but a lot of commitment to public interest. And so we sit there and we say, I don't know, should we make this person an offer? Do you think we can convert them? And it's really much more rare that we take those people than we take someone with a lot of public interest experience or you know it could be working for a politician any kind of outreach we our organization is um, very campaigny and we like um, activism so any of those things can weigh a lot more in your favor than grades so if if we ask about it you know it'd be nice if you said oh you know if you acknowledged it honestly like I had a lot of difficulty with contrast um, because we've all been there. We've all been in law school and there are hard classes. But I, I wouldn't get hung up on it at all. Yeah, I agree. I mean, uh, if you've made it to the interview stage, I mean, you're in pretty good sh shape on that realm. I do agree there is a sliding scale. We will, like, once we're considering candidates, like, um, if, if you've shown a, a great, like, academic record, that will be a plus factor for you. Um, but um, yeah, I actually happen to think with regard, I don't, I, 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 I'm not sure why it turns me off, but I'm, I'm sometimes turned off by explanations as to why your academic record isn't that good. I just think it's dangerous territory. Um, I, and again, I can't pinpoint why, and maybe, but, but I have had interviews where people were like, well, you may have been, seen my, my transcript and, uh, you know, while it's not as like good as I want it to be, you will notice that in like my my like like you know some like legal philosophy seminar, I got an A plus. And actually, I I was I, got, I I didn't look at specific classes, and I really didn't need them to mention that. And I, somehow it just turns awkward. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, but I, but I generally don't ask. Uh, it's it, it, you know it, generally if you get the interview, it's because because you've shown a commitment to this work, and um, I presume uh, you you're bright bright enough to like to handle it, and um, you know yeah. I don't know if that. Helps. Yeah, I, instead of worrying about grades, you should reread your cover letter because yeah, it's more yeah. often than like. Oh, they have the worst run-on sentences in their cover letter, or the typos, or whatever. That's um, more off-putting than that great legal writing. It, I, I totally agree with that. And just to give you an example, like, I, and, and, and something you said earlier was great, where it's like, 
you'll have these meetings where you're like, well, maybe we could turn this like really like this 3.9 student into a great public interest attorney. Like we never do that. Like, and it does like touch our minds sometimes. Or like, look, this person's from Yale. You know, they've never shown any interest in in, in like public interest, but they're from Yale. We never hire that person. Like, we we always think like, man, maybe they turn into like you know Superman and fly off and save everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't happen. And, and it worked for like the Supreme Court. So <laughs> no, and, yeah, so I'm really like, I, and, and I, we, we live in a community, uh, the, the public interest community, where we, we see who succeeds. And I, I don't often look at like, I don't see like common strains of academic excellence necessarily in, um, in, in the biographies of the, lead, of the leadership of this community. And that's not to say any poorly of that. It's just that if you go to the private sector and you go to the managing partners at like Oric and big law firms like that, you will see like Harvard, Harvard, triple Harvard degrees and blah, blah, blah. And you're kind of, you know, because they live in that world. But um, in this world, it's not like that. Um, uh, we have so many uh, public interest leaders uh, graduating from the, the spectrum of schools. And so I, there's a great respect for the entire community. Maybe doesn't exist in the five seconds. Thanks. I appreciate this comment. You take care of anything else you want? Yeah. Um, I've never been asked about my grades in an interview. Um, and because I was never asked, I never said anything about it. I think that's a pretty good policy to go by is if you're not asked, don't say anything. <coughs> um, because obviously it wasn't very important. Uh, I've had a lot, obviously, a lot more time spent talking about. Um, the experiences that I've had, and that has seemed to be a lot more valuable. As, as it was mentioned earlier, you have an extremely small amount of time in these interviews, and um, I think they often want to get to the point of what they care about. <clears throat> I mean, and I think if someone does ask you about your grades, um, perhaps this wouldn't work so much for a first year, but as a second year, I think that you can point to some of perhaps your elective classes and say, build up that support for your dedication and say, I've taken these three environmental classes, and um, I found out that I love trees, and I found I researched this, and I wrote this amazing paper, and it really highlighted my experience in this way, and really re-motivated me to um, dive into this field. I think you can turn an awkward question into a chance to show, um, again, pulling it back to why you're there and why you care. So that would be my technique if I ever was asked that question. I've never been asked about my academic performance either. Um, the only time I bring it up is when I know it will work for my advantage. Uh, I remember I've been asked, how do you feel about writing and research, or what's, um, what are your writing and research skills? So I bring up the fact that I, uh, I did well in my legal writing and research class. But other than that, I've never been asked or, or bring it up unless it's necessary. Thank you. Um, Michael, Catherine, what questions do you like to hear from students when it's their opportunity to ask? And I know these interviews are short, oftentimes you might not get to that place, but if you ask the student um, if they have any questions for you, what are, what are the questions you, you, like to, you like to hear? Oh, is it the turn? Is it? <laughs> oh, it's my turn? I'm not sure. Good. Um, so I have two answers to that. If I can answer your question, there are two parts. Would the second part first call me? Right, the second part first. Um, I think the easiest good question um, that, that I hear often um, is I love asking the interviewer how they ended up in the place where they are. Um, uh, it, it, and it recognizes the importance of like the stories of public interest attorneys and, and, and other public service attorneys. Um, uh, and so I think that's an easy question that's not offensive. It also, like for those of us who like to talk a lot, like myself, um, it gives me an opportunity to talk about myself. Um, so I think that's easy. Um, in, in, the, now, there, I, there have been some particularly special, specific questions that I've heard in my time, and they relate to specific work at our organization. <coughs> It's, but I've, all, I've seen that um, rise and fall. So I've heard, like, if you know something, um, like, you know, I was, like, for instance, um, uh, if you're interviewing for a job in justice and you attended um, the Marin uh, uh, holiday clinics and you wanted to, you were like, uh, you know, I was at the Marin holiday clinics 
it, you know, I, I serve three clients. I'm you know wondering what you know like what 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 justice has to do to organize those and how it maximizes like the amount of clients it can serve and give it off. That's fantastic. It shows that that can backfire if you don't have all the information that um, uh, that you need to ask specific questions. So um, so a safe way of of, 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 of of wowing people and then a less safe. Well, he took my answer. Yes, first. yes. <laughs> Your first next one. <laughs> um, but I would say to keep in mind that the interviews are a two-way street. And this may just be consolation when you don't get an interview. But, you know, the, you're also interviewing them if you or don't get a, a position. And if you don't get a position there, it's likely that you might not fit in there anyway. So when I was straight out of graduate school, I thought I wanted to be a marine scientist. And I was pretty much apolitical. I didn't follow the news at all. And so I went to Capitol Hill and I interviewed for both sides of the aisle, like Democrats and Republicans. And I had no idea of like, the difference between the two or anything. And then after a year of working there, I thought, oh my goodness, what would have happened if I had gotten an offer on the other side? Like it never would have worked. I wouldn't have been in there at all. And of course, that was probably very evident to the person interviewing me. Um, but at the time, I just wasn't aware. And I think that that's probably true for most offices, that every office has their own little vibe, their own little culture. And so you should try to pick up on that as much as you can by asking you know, how that person got their job or what they like most about their job or something that lets them talk about it talk and talk about themselves so you can figure out what their personality is like and you know, what you actually want to spend 20 hours a week in their office. Can I answer this? Please. Sorry about mine. Um, I always ask, and I didn't mention this, but um, what your level of supervision is like. Um, because I, I think when you're talking about a two-way street, I think as much as they're interviewing you, you're interviewing them because you're going to be spending a whole summer working with them. And I think you need to know your personality enough so to know, do you want to work alone? Do you want to work uh, closely with the supervisor? Is the supervisor that they're going to put you with going to be out on maternity leave and they're going to be rotating you around the office and I think that it's a fairly um, it's, a, it's a good question just to ask what like what kind of interaction do I get with my supervisor and how do you normally pair people up because that's something that I'm interested in knowing about is what is my summer going to look like and that's something that I, I always ask like, that it's pretty important to know um, I, think I, I always ask um, what do you like the most about your job? And I feel like that every time I ask that, I can see them really excited to talk about what they like the most about their job, which helps me because I get some time to just relax. And <laughs> <laughs> so um, that, that one question. And interviews are about building a personal connection. So if you're, if you're engaging with them on that subject, something that they like talking about, which is themselves, then that's, that's always good. Um, opinion on, on thank you notes. Do you, do you get them? Do you think they're helpful? Oh, do I go first now? No, you go first. You go first. Okay. Yeah. I would say that you know sometimes I do get them and they're compelling, and but it shouldn't be something. I would just make it special. If you feel like you can really write a good thank you note, or you really enjoyed this interview, or you really liked the person, and you can write a genuine thank you note, then do so. But we don't get thank you notes from everyone we interview at PIPS. Sometimes we do get thank you notes, and sometimes we hire those people. But um, so I, I would just say, don't do it if it's going to be a form thank you letter, because I don't think it's worth it. Um, wow, I, I, I'm going to I'm going to like maybe diverge a little bit from that. Um, I, I we have actually not hired people because we did get some sort of thank you note. Uh, let me preface that on uh, <laughs> on that um, it wasn't from an event like the IPS day. Um, uh, it was it was an in office interview where they knew that they were one of the final four or five people, and so so maybe that's the difference. Um, I would agree with the form issue. You should mention one specific thing that was mentioned during the interview. So I don't know what advice for you to, to take away from from this. Um, uh, for for me, I would I I expect some sort of recognition that we met. Um, and, and I get, but I do agree it's got to mention something specific, like, hey, it took your advice on like that sandwich spot, or <laughs> no, which is really important. It, it is really, really, it, it, you know, I think important. It, just to identify yourself for that. It, 
Do we, do we take the questions from my last video? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Should we take over? No, just, okay. just, yes. um, <laughs> just a question for that, because um, do you have to go traditional route of mailing a card or a thank you follow-up email? What's your take on that? It would, well, if, if we're speaking to like, yeah, no, I would scare the crap out of everybody. <laughs> oh, and I'd like probably, this is, I should have gone first. Then. Um, uh, email's fine. That, that's what, like, yeah, email's fine. I, I do find cards, like, like the actual cards we send in the mail, particularly special, but it, it, it hasn't been in this sort of like world, the, the, this world that I've created where it, it seems to be a prerequisite. Um, I, I haven't, I, the, the, yeah, the, in pen, paper version isn't required. Um, emails that are just fine. Yeah, yeah. And again, I'm, I'm, I, I guess I'm being a little. I'm trying to now. I'm trying to walk myself down from my dramatic <laughs> um, initial response. Um, I think it, it probably played out that way in the Tantico situation because we were down to four or five, and it was difficult to distinguish people. And so I just think it's a way of distinguishing yourself when when we're deciding. I'm always deciding between two or three people. Oh, I've never been in a position where there's just a clear cut winner. I just haven't. Um, um, and so that's made a difference sometimes. Isn't that crazy? Oh, so, I would say if you really want the job, you should probably write it down. <laughs> Be on the safe side, right? Uh, but don't, I can't imagine writing it for 15 years. That yeah. yeah, no, I understand. Uh, but the one thing you know that I probably will remember the rest of my life was incredible and it was from a PIPS day and it was a thank you note and she had all these stamps and of species and one of them was a species that we worked on really and they weren't even current stamps they were like from her personal collection so there's it's all a matter of degrees right. your you stamps will be better <laughs> <laughs> We require stamps. <laughs> Mateka, Sherry, comments on this question about thank you notes. Yeah, I think they're necessary. Um, last year, when I was sitting as an audience in one of these panels, one of the panelists said that uh, she saw a student actually have thank you cards with her at uh, PIPS Day, and I didn't believe her. I was like, no, that can't be. That can't be true. So I went to PIPS Day, and I did see students with thank you cards. So uh, for PIPS Day, I did both. I um, wrote an email and also followed up with a thank you card. Uh, but recently, I've, I've been doing um, emails only. But for PIPS Day, I did both. And that, I felt that kind of helped me <laughs> with the, um, with the um, Yeah, I'm going to go back to the ledge you were on and <laughs> say I'm pretty traditional as well. And I think that it's just a really good habit to get into. I think you're going to want to write them for a number of aspects of things that further your legal career, whether it's letter of recommendations or um, lunches that you have with people that you're doing informational interviews. I just think it's a really good habit to start and get into. And um, I even wrote letters, I wrote personal mail letters to the people that I interviewed with, and then I wrote emails to the people that I met in the open whatever they call that. The it's now table talk. Table right. talk. Um, <laughs> the yeah, and when I was sitting in this audience, someone also sort of pulling in people from the past, um, said whenever you get a card from someone you've spoken with at a table to write down something specific that you talked about on the back of their card. So when you write them a thank you note or you write them an email, you say, thank you so and so, so great to talk to you, and here's the specific fact that we talked about. and. Um, thank you so much for your time. It, it wasn't even an interview, but it was just a, here's my name, remember who I am, and I and I appreciated you being there on that day. And I think that, that was, I mean, I don't think anyone wrote me back, but it, it can't really hurt, I suppose, and it doesn't really take that much time. You know, can I just mention one thing? That, that's a great point, because at last year's Meet the Advocates, I, I uh, staffed one justice table, and I had a bunch of people uh, come by, and one of those people, um, uh, emailed me afterwards, say so great talking to you, blah, blah blah. And I, we weren't offering a summer position last year, but I forwarded his stuff to like to an organization and said like this is really good. You know, this guy seemed really good, and I think I think he ended up interning there at least like part time. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I, something is stressier, especially in like um, 
in the large, like in the legal services world, if you're looking to help low-income people get legal help, there's like a trillion organizations in the Bay Area, and we all hang out together behind your backs. <laughs> um, and so, getting like finding an advocate for yourself is is can be instrumental, if not just short term, but long term. Thank you. So, uh, next question. Um, besides whether or not they sent you a thank you note. <laughs> What are the primary reasons you have for eliminating the candidates? I mean, I gather, and I tell students this all the time, that you're probably making some very, very difficult decisions after the interview. You've interviewed a host of candidates, and um, you, you have to make these sort of hair splitting decisions. How have you done that in the past? Like, you know, what criteria have you ultimately come down to? Um, go ahead. Oh, no, no. Okay, I'll go ahead. Um, I think it comes down to the interest that you express in the organization and the experience you have that's relevant. I mean, we've said that before, but I don't think I can get away from that. And then it comes down to how polished you are in the interview and how well you can speak after you're asked a question and whether you answer it directly and whether you can come up with a good answer. And so that gets back to the preparation and you know, thinking about what questions you're going to ask and already having an answer that you've rehearsed before you get to the interview. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, uh, I think that we eliminate people um, because their narrative wasn't convincing or their explanation of why they want to work at our organization wasn't terribly convincing. And I, I'm, I, I'm positive that that comes from just like failure to prepare. Um, like the, the people who are successful were. And then I think the final decision, because again, I mentioned we always have two or three people we're battling against, was based on several factors. Um, one, I always look at like steadiness, like if I thought the person could handle, so it's a, it's a pressure-filled pressure -filled world that we live in. There's so much at stake in public interest at work. I, some people um, uh, don't realize that, um, especially as law students. They think that the private sector is where that lives. I've actually had um, the great joy of working on both sides. I actually worked in the private sector before I worked in public interest. I can say the pressure I feel now is far greater. And so I do look for steadiness. And then second, this is really important, um, like to affability. Like, like you're, you're somebody that I'm going to get along with. I mean, it's we've got, we're like going to war together. And um, uh, and, and uh, it, a poor metaphor, but still. Uh, um, and, you know, it's, I want to know that like this is this is somebody who myself and our staff is gonna is gonna get along with. Um, that I think that for that and like you know half a handle of whiskey usually. <laughs> There's a sense of trenches though. I mean, when we do table talk prep and the employers show up and they're all sitting at their various tables and they're 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 prepping their tables before the event starts. Everybody is this is sort of this sense of camaraderie and enjoyment and seeing one another and there's a sense of community. And so I think that is that is important. So that, it is, going, it is difficult work, so people want to work with others that they like working with. Um, question for all of you. Um, if a student doesn't get offered a job with your uh, organization, or if you didn't get offered a job with your organization, what are some of the ways that student can sustain their relationship? We see people apply many times, and that helps. So it, don't be afraid to come back the next year or the next term. We offer internships all year round. We don't hire for the summer at PIPS, but we hire for fall and spring, and we're very flexible about how to work you in. And, and the other great thing to see for people, from people is both that they, if they're not working for us, they're working on something related. Um, and then if we hear from a professor, or someone else in the community that you've met, basically anybody that you meet that's in that field, you say, do you know this organization? Do you know anyone that works there? And try to get through in another channel um, and network is really helpful. Well, one of the things that you suggest is that because you may not have been offered an internship position, doesn't mean that the organization is not interested in hearing from you ever again. That's a concern that sometimes gets raised with students, right? I mean, right. it could just be it's that. It's not a final decision right. in our mind. Yeah, no, I, I to totally, totally agree. Uh, it, it, yeah, no, I, I totally, totally agree. And, and with that said, I've, I've never um, avoided or said no to an offer for a cup of coffee to talk through your career goals and to help. Um, it's a part of it, 
is that I, I don't, just like, just like you, um, I don't want to feel sort of like the awkwardness of the fact that like, it wasn't a match. These are really difficult decisions at the really difficult times. Our organizations are so underfunded currently, and we, I, I, we do not hire most of the people we like. I mean, we, we just don't. And so I'd love to be able to help you in any way uh, I, I, I can. Um, and I think being open to that, to that relationship, is like the most important thing. Like, let's not make it awkward. Let's, I'm happy to help. I'm happy to connect to you. I think that's a great point. If you're applying for something else, like, hey, Mike, do you know anybody at East Bay Community Law Center? Like, I do. And I'm happy to actually send your, your you know, like your, your application or just send a note telling you that, like, oh, I met this great person. Um, uh, that happens all the time. And, and I, I mean, I applied to, this was not the first public interest job that I applied for. Um, <laughs> Like, I, I did not get, like, it's not like it just happened magically. I applied to a lot of places, and then I asked to have coffee, and then they, like, you know, recommended me to this, and, and the network grew, and my odds, I presume, got better, and then I eventually got a job. Um, and so I, I think it's, I think we, we would love for you to stay um, in our community. I also think that there's a crazy idea, which is kind of like, hey, I know that the, the position this summer is not, do you offer a fall internship? Do you need volunteers otherwise? Is there any way I can get involved with your work, or do you have any recommendations of where I can get involved? I mean, it is like, it is a, um, it is sort of a, a, a doing world, this the public interest community. Like, it's, you can, you can express your interests all you want to, but if you haven't actually volunteered and worked for these organizations, it's not gonna mean much. Um, so you want to get on the ground and you want to actually be helping people uh, or causes. Those are kind of the words that I was just going to say. I totally stole that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I was going to piggyback on that and say that one of the benefits of being in this area is that you're here year round. And uh, I think we've talked about in the past that a lot of students want to eventually work in this area because it's amazing. And so you get a lot of students from schools all over the country that want to be here for the summer and want to have these opportunities. And so it's incredibly competitive. And I think if you, you know, if you don't get the offer, I think you just you know, you gave it your best. But I think that being said is the pool kind of thins out a lot more in the fall and the spring. And it doesn't hurt to, sit, to follow up with them, even when they've t told you that you didn't get the position to follow up and say, but I still really liked your organization, and I still really enjoyed meeting you. And you know, can I contact you about a position in the fall or the spring? And um, I'm still really interested in being a part of your program. And that's worked for me um, through almost all of my internships that I've done that. And I've and I've they've been more than happy to accommodate me in the fall and the spring. Um, so I would strongly recommend to do that because I think that that's an opportunity that you have that others don't because we. We live and work here. I don't think there's anything else I can add. That was really helpful what they said. So. Thank you. Uh, I'll take the opportunity now to open up the room for questions for any of the people on our panel. Anything that you are curious about? Abby. So, um, what I kind of heard from some of you is uh, you've seen interviewees kind of stumble or it gets awkward. How to sort of best recover? to smile and realize that you're talking to a person um, and be friendly and uh, so sort of take it down the level and you know don't think oh I'm sitting here in this interview and I just stumbled but just smile and say you know start over again yeah, I, I, yeah, I touched, I touched on this before um, about like after the hiring process, but I think it applies also during the interview. Like, um, we're going to feel probably well, as awkward, or we're going to feel somewhat awkward also about this position. And the more sort of comfortable you can make it for us, I think the better it's going to be. Because I, mean, I look for that, again, I mentioned like steadiness. I look for that kind of steadiness anyway. I screw up all the time. I misspeak because I talk too much. Um, and so I'm constantly having to apologize for myself. But if you, uh, again, if you can sort of like make sure that like you've got like eye contact, that you're like, okay, that came out, even if you say like that came out weird. It's going to show the human element to you. If you've got the the su substance um, in you um, and you prepared for this, it's going to come out right. Like a one, you can't screw up the interview. You can really only screw up the preparation. Like, 
Uh, I, I really like, I really believe that. Um, unless like you lock down, and then uh, then you know you should go see, you speak to Liar. I know that that is an issue, and you should speak to Liar. Um, but if it's just a slip up or something like that, that's not gonna matter. I would never say, oh, well, these two candidates, this person like misspoke or said something awkward and didn't realize it. I, I would never say that. Like I would always go back to the actual substance. Of the um. No, I feel like that's almost inevitable. You may have one or two this stuff in an interview, but just try to end it in a good note. Make sure you, you the last thing you said is something that will really help your application process. I agree. <laughs> I don't know if anybody would have a, a really good answer for this, but how do you think a government internship interview would differ from a public interest interview? Actually, I interned uh, at, with a government agency my first year, so I'm trying to think. Um, I remember it being a little bit more serious. Um, oh, I was thinking. Yeah, I remember. Is anybody that I've, I've, well, right. Well, I, I was a government attorney for years, and I think some of the things that, yes, it, it, it tends to be a little bit more serious. One of the things that I think the attorneys really do look for is a commitment to, um, to government work, to working for um, uh, larger constituencies. Often, the, the work that you'll find that the, the folks are doing at the nonprofits, uh, you know, some of it is direct legal services, some of it is impact litigation, and if it's not, there are often clients or constituencies, much more specific ones that those agencies are representing. Mm -hmm. In the government setting, it's not that much. You're often representing the people, and it's a little bit more faceless. So, what is driving that interest in terms of working for that for that government entity? And I think I think there has to be again a narrative behind that. Why, okay. where that comes from. Uh, whether it's a public defender's office, where yes, you have clients, but. Um, you, you, you are performing a public service, or a district attorney's office, or um, uh, you know, an attorney general's office. Is it ever appropriate to ask about job opportunities after graduation? I, I wouldn't find it offensive at all. Um, and it's a question that I know I've asked. Um, I, I mean, you, you, you might not get a good, a positive answer um, to it, uh, just because in our world, it's uh, you know, it's small nonprofits, um, it doesn't doesn't necessarily work like that. But um, I I think it shows an interest. It shows a continuing. It like shows that you probably have a continuing interest in working for us. Um, Particularly depending on how that question is phrased. Yeah, right. absolutely. With that, I don't know. Yeah, I would agree. People often ask, and we can only say, you know, we don't have any idea who we'll be hiring in a year, or if we'll be hiring anyone in a year, but it, we do hire our former interns and volunteers way more frequently than just somebody off the street. So it will increase your chances of getting a job here. Any more questions? Last one, yes. Okay, aside from like the etiquette we learned in high school or whatever, just one or two like big things that you're like, ooh, that kind of rubs me the wrong way with etiquette, like, so anything come to mind, something that someone did that you were like, ooh. <laughs> That's a great question. Wow. I, I can only think of, ex I, I can't think of the big things, and I, actually I think they're small things. Well, let me make it a big thing. One big thing and then one specific example. Um, it's great to treat the dialogue um, as, uh, as a little bit casual. I, I think that adds like, sort of a naturalness to it. Um, uh, you obviously don't want to go too far, um, and you definitely do not, oh, and this is a, yeah, don't, what you don't want to do, don't speak over the interviewer. Never speak over the interview. You never know who you're going to have in that room, and some people are really, some people, just are used to discourse like that, where you talk over each other. I come from a family where if you wait until somebody ends, you will sit there for like <laughs> eternity. Um, but no matter what, wait until the person is finished. Even if they're speaking really slowly, and it seems like they're never gonna get to the end. Um, but so, um, so with that said, um, that goes too far. I do like casualness, but I, I, I will mention this just because I know this is like a talking point and Leor's probably mentioned this. Um, I, I remember one interview where somebody showed up, 
they wore a tie, but it was sort of undone and slagging off to the side. And that what I, I honestly was like, what is this? Like, where did you, in what world? I mean, it's one thing if like, you show up, I don't know, it's sort of like with a mod look, and it's just slightly off the thing you've got it. But this was just a mess. And I remember thinking, like, what? I, the, my, my thought was like, he doesn't care, but he has another job. This person has another job, and they don't care about this. So I, I block watch or something. Yeah, and I would say the familiarity thing can get too familiar. So just remember that you still are presenting yourself, and um, you know we you probably shouldn't talk about your soft story about getting an internship or how it's so hard or the job market is terrible. And um, still try to make it you know your your own advocate. Try to make your best case for getting hired and tell us the good things about you. Well, please join me in thanking our illustrious panel.